if you look at transgenic studies, you see that fructose is a problem. You see that it is a problem because of an enzyme we have in our body called fructokinase C. What happens is this fructokinase C not only degrades our gut, but it also helps contribute to the formation of a fatty liver and other issues that arise secondarily to that. Now we know this because we've seen in studies that when they knock out fructokinase, meaning get rid of fructokinase in the body altogether, fatty liver doesn't form in the presence of fructose. So this means that fruit is automatically bad, right? Fruit has fructose. So it would make sense that fruit is making us fat and fruit is evil. Not if you look at the data and you understand how to perceive this stuff and see it. No one is denying that fructose is a problem in the scientific community, okay? But what we have to understand is what's happening, okay? So fructose has to be phosphorylated. That means that when you eat fructose, you have to take energy in the way of ATP from your liver to actually add a phosphate group to the fructose. What happens is this process can quickly deplete our energy in our liver. And when our energy in our liver is depleted, all kinds of metabolic problems can occur because we don't have energy for protein synthesis, we don't have energy for mitochondria stability, so our mitochondria become disabled and dysfunctional. It really is a problem, like fructose is a metabolic problem. But fruit is not bad. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, like fruit has fructose, so it's automatically evil, and I've seen videos on this. Well, let's first look at large epidemiological data, okay? 52,000 people in this study over 4.2 years. Out of these 52,000 people, 2,130 of them ended up with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, okay? What they found is that in men, fruit had no association with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, none whatsoever. In fact, in women, fruit actually was protective against non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we have to remember something very important here though. I'm gonna get into the why this is occurring in a second. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and being overweight or obese are two things that feed each other. So sometimes you'll see people be obese first and then develop NAFLD, and sometimes you'll see it the other way around. There was a study that was published in Immunity, Inflammation, and Disease that put this kind of nicely. Basically, it said that you start out with a fatty liver. This fatty liver becomes more inflamed. The inflammation leads to fibrosis, which leads to what's called a non-alcoholic steatosis, basically a rigid fibrosis liver. And that ends up affecting our overall level of adiposity, how much fat we gain. When you disable the liver and make it more dysfunctional, it's easier to store fat because metabolically things are just deranged at this point. So again, it means like, what the heck? Then why is fruit protective? Well, we have to look at, first of all, energy density. And I know the human body is an open thermodynamic system, which means that there's a lot of variables with thermodynamics. It's not as simple as, as people might make it seem. It's complicated, right? But we cannot deny energy density is a thing. One gram of oil has nine calories. 50 grams of a tomato has nine calories. That means, simple math, that a tomato is 50 times less dense than oil, okay? Well, this applies with fruit. I want you to think about this. One Snickers bar has 15 grams of fructose. We're not talking about carbs here. We're talking about fructose, separate and apart from regular carbohydrates, okay? I bet you didn't even know that a Snickers bar had fructose, because we think fructose, and we see what's out there on the internet, we think fruit, okay? Well, check this out. 15 grams of fructose in a Snickers bar. That's about three bananas. Okay, three bananas is not a complete, like, unheard of amount of bananas to eat. Personally, I don't know anyone that eats three bananas. I might have known a person that would eat two bananas after, like, a run or something. But three bananas, you're kind of a weirdo, but you're not a complete freak. Okay, well, so that's reasonable. Now let's look at, like, a can of Coke. Okay, a can of Coke, 26 grams of fructose. We're not just talking about glucose, regular carbs, we're talking about fructose, okay? That is more like the ballpark of anywhere from five to nine bananas, depending on the size of the banana. We're talking like three to five apples, depending on the size of the apple, and we're talking like five or six cups of blueberries. You would have to be eating a lot of fruit, okay? Now there's other variables that come into this that we're gonna talk about here in a second because we have to make a complete point with this. 
and I really need you to understand what is happening with fatty liver and gaining fat with fructose because it's not happening from all this fruit you're eating. The bottom line, again, I'll say it again, is fructose is a giant flipping problem, but not in human amounts that we are getting from fruit. Okay? If you are eating a bucket of fruit, then you're probably not eating that same equivalent of fructose or more of fructose in Snickers bars. So you're probably doing yourself a service. And you're probably in enough of a caloric deficit by eating fruit and not Snickers that even if you don't believe in thermodynamics, you're probably in enough of a deficit to offset a fatty liver. But now it's where things get interesting and you have to have a little bit of understanding of even medicine to really, really fully comprehend this. I want to explain something on the for side of this, okay? A lot of times you'll see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease treated with antibiotics. How does that make sense? Now, I don't necessarily agree with everything that happens there, right? But that is one of the treatment modalities for specific cases of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It has to do with, again, the fructokinase. Fructokinase, that enzyme in our body that responds to the fructose that we eat, that can actually break down our gut Okay, that damages the gut barrier. So once again, you're looking at it and you're saying, another reason not to eat fruit. I don't want that fructose causing that problem. We've even seen in studies that fructose consumption and then knocking out fructokinase, there was no gut breakdown, no gut permeability. But as soon as fructokinase is back in the body, human body, as it should be, the gut permeability breaks happens when you consume fructose. What happens with gut permeability? With gut permeability, you have bacteria, you have lipopolysaccharides, you have pathogens that cross into the bloodstream. When those cross into the bloodstream, that calls on inflammation because inflammation needs to deal with those pathogens because it's an unnatural thing. So the pathogens are dealt with, but there's inflammation. Inflammation can lead to a fatty liver. Inflammation leads to obesity. Inflammation leads to metabolic derangement. And there we have our problem. So in the medical situation, they give antibiotics to fight off the bacteria that might be leaking into the bloodstream and ultimately treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, I'm not a doctor. I can't explain a lot of the medicine side of that, but it gives us an indicator here. But with fruit, you have a very big piece there, fiber. And the fiber fuels the production of butyrate, and butyrate triggers the protection of our gut lining. So what happens is when butyrate increases because of the fiber in fruit, we ultimately end up with a larger expression of genes that code for proteins that protect our gut. So this means that even though there's a smidget of fructose in fruit, and it all depends on the kind of fruit you're eating, by the way, but the fiber acts as somewhat of a protective effect so that even if there were a fair bit of lipopolysaccharides to leak in, the butyrate acts as a little bit of a buffer by coding for more proteins to make those junctions tighter and not let those pathogens fruit. Not to mention, when you do eat diverse amounts of fruit, you do have an increase in different species of bacteria that lead to an increase in what are called incretins, gut incretins. These are hormone-like compounds that our body produces that make you more satiated, ultimately eat less. I know we all like to think that we can eat 10,000 calories and not gain weight, but there is a line somewhere. It's different for different people on different days, okay? But if you are satiated and you are not eating as much, you are gonna make better decisions and you're probably not gonna build all that material around the liver, i.e. fatty liver. I will suggest that if you are making shifts towards kind of improving your microbiome, a good probiotic is Seed. It's down below in the description. People ask me all the time. It's the one that I use. I use it somewhat sparingly. Like when I'm changing my diet, I like to have a probiotic on hand so that I can kind of adapt quicker. But that link is down below. It'll save you 15% off. It's a symbiotic. And I really like them because they put their money where their mouth is with research. But also the technology is cool. That capsule inside of a capsule technology. So it has a symbi it's a symbiotic, which means it has a prebiotic and a probiotic. So definitely the probiotic I would recommend if you're trying to kind of improve your gut diversity and go the whole gut health route because I think it's an important angle to tackle. So that link is down below in the description. Now we have to have a little bit of a lesson in how insulin resistance can make you gain fat, but also how insulin resistance leads to a fatty liver, okay? This is very interesting because what happens is when you are insulin resistant, it's not just happening in your muscle cells. 
your fat cells become insulin resistant too. And when your fat cells become insulin resistant, they actually increase the rate of lipolysis. Lipolysis is the mobilization of fat into the bloodstream. Normally, this is a tremendous thing. We normally, in a healthy situation, want fat going into the bloodstream. But if you are an insulin resistant person, lipolysis is just occurring independent of oxidation, meaning you're liberating these fats out of a fat cell into the bloodstream, into circulation, with nowhere to flip and go. So where do they go? They go to the liver and they ultimately get stored. So to put things in a very colloquial sense, you've basically liberated fat from your left calf and now it's liberated up and it's circulating and it goes to your liver. This is a problem, obviously. Okay, and the more that this happens, the more we have a vicious cycle of inflammation occurring as well. So, well, okay, step one, do what you can to improve the insulin resistance. Reducing calories, fasting, lower carb protocols here and there, exercise, all valid ways to reduce insulin resistance. But one of the things that's very interesting is there's some solid evidence behind quercetin and various micronutrients like flavonoids and polyphenols that are in fruit that protect us from these kinds of things happening. So quercetin, for example, can actually help protect against renal fat accumulation, that's kidney fat. So what the heck? Okay, so we have all these different barriers helping us. Now quercetin can also help with lipotoxicity. As a flavonoid and it has antioxidant properties, it helps fight off some of those lipids that are circulating and prevents the damage from occurring in the first place. Now another very interesting compound that you're going to find in a lot of fruit, like apples and blackberries and blueberries, is going to be something called epicatechin. Epicatechin has been demonstrated to influence how much we have in the way of circulating triglycerides, so it lowers triglyceride. It also influences what is called SREB1, which is the main transcription factor that has to do with synthesizing and taking up cholesterol. So you see what I'm getting at here. Okay, it's not like you are guzzling pure fructose. That is a different situation. Your amount of density of fructose that you're getting within, from fruit is a completely different ballgame, not to mention the fiber, not to mention the various micronutrients, polyphenols, flavonoids that play a significant role in protecting against these very obscure things that happen as a result of hyper-processed fructose. Fructose is in so much stuff and you don't even realize it. Pretty much any processed food out there that is relatively sweet is going to give you a significant bolus of fructose that's probably more so than what you're going to get from a slice of watermelon. So stop freaking out about it. Have your fruit because it's probably going to prevent you from grabbing a Snickers. I'll see you tomorrow.